I want to talk this morning about truly building your faith walk and, and what that means to us. And you'll recall, we're slowly working our way through Second Peter and, and so on and so forth. And then we come to that place in the passage, which we'll be looking at eventually, where Paul or Peter is actually just talking about what it means to build a faith walk. And it comes to, down to being the kind of person that, that God wants you to be over time understanding it's a process it also brings some ease in our experience and 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 I think that's helpful it's a process right slow down relax with what God's doing to you and I think that's important and and we take our cues from scripture and I like that that um, scripture tells us all we need to know about becoming the kind of people we need to be. And as we digest scripture, God works changes in us. And when you think about it, you know, I, I have a reputation for telling people to read their Bibles every day. And, and the reason isn't because if you memorize everything in there, you can mechanically make yourself a better person. It's because the Bible has this, this power as God's word to transform you in ways that you don't notice right away. And that it's through God's word that he's doing the work. It's not you doing the work. The Bible isn't a self-help book. It's the word of God transforming us. And, and so I think about that. Some of the questions. Have you ever struggled with hearing God's voice? I know you have because people say, I don't hear God's voice. Do you sometimes feel anxious over finding his will? Are you ever unsure about what God wants you to do? Do you sometimes feel you lack the perfect motive or attitude? Few people want to answer that, but your expression spoke very loudly. <clears throat> I have really good news for you. None of those things has anything to do with becoming a better Christian. You don't become a better Christian because you hear God's voice. You don't become a better Christian because your attitude is perfect all the time. And if some of you are struggling with that, get past your legalism and hear the whole sermon before you flip out. Um, you, you don't become a better Christian by having that perfect motive or, or even finding that specific will all the time. If, if that were true, if that was the necessity of the Christian life, then Jesus would judge your motives. He would judge your attitudes. He'd judge, and I mean attitudes that don't lead to sin. He would judge the way you hear from him, he would judge your spiritual sensitivity. But the Bible says he's going to judge the things we do. I like that. It just suddenly makes it manageable. And, and we'll see that. now. So I want to read a text that's not in Second Peter to start with. And we'll just see how this sermon goes. Hopefully there are enough notes for two sermons. And I won't finish it today. Um, but... Uh, because, you know, I get thoughts in the process. In Matthew 7, I want to read from Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Now, I've quoted this verse in different times, and we've read it and taught on it before. But I, I see something different there that I haven't really addressed that I wanted to share. And it, it's the story of, you know, when the Lord says in the last day, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven and and many will come to me in the last day. And so it's a picture of the white throne judgment when Christ judges humanity. And it says this, many will come to me on that day, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we force out demons and do many miracles by the power and authority of your name? Then I will tell them publicly, I never knew you. Get away from me, you evil people. Now, this might surprise you, but... I see good news in this passage. And, and the good news is this. <clears throat> you don't have to move in all the big miracles to go to heaven. I am relieved. I don't know if you are, but I'm, I'm relieved. 
I don't have to do miracles. I don't have to prophesy. I don't have to cast out demons. I don't have to do signs and wonders. I don't have to do any of that stuff to go to heaven. Now that's a load off. Because I haven't always figured out how to do it all the time. When it, you know, when it comes to getting your prayers answered in the way that you want them to, I don't have any answers to that. Now, getting them answered in the way God wants to, I don't have to worry about that. Because he will always answer prayers the way he wants to. And I can't force him to answer them the way I want to. And when we talk about people praying for healing, I've prayed for people and they've received healing. I can't figure out how to bat a thousand. I can't figure out how to, how to get my, every time I pray for someone, they get healed. I can't figure that out. And, and incidentally, no one else can either. They like to say they can, but they're lying. Say, well, that's pretty a uh, bold statement. No, it's not. They're just lying. It's an observation. And if you track their statistics, you'll find out they're not. In fact, one guy, I, th I appreciated his honesty, uh, and he's a four-square guy. He wrote a book about a lot of the, th the prayers God's answering, and, and he's prayed for people, and they've, they've been healed, and, and, and the dead's been raised, and all kinds of wonderful things have taken place. And, and in an interview, this young lady asked him, so how, how many of your prayers get answered the way you expect? So 1%. Now, that's honesty. And, and here's the good news. I don't know how to do that, so I'm so glad that doesn't matter when it comes time to go to heaven. Now, the problem, these, the mistake these people were making was, well, if we do enough of what John Wimber called the stuff, We'll make it. But what Jesus is telling them, it's not that that gets you to heaven. And he said, when he says, depart from me, you evil people, he actually uses this word in Greek, anomia, and it means anti-law. You who reject the word. And, and what we realize is, all I have to do is read the Bible and do my best to follow it. It becomes very simple. I find that relieving. And, and, you know, it was Dave and I were joking around this morning. He's been watching too much Hallmark, he says. I don't know why he does that. <laughs> we'll, we'll say he's being a good husband. I don't know. But apparently I'm not as good a husband. Um, Debbie watches it in another room. They all end the same. They, every single Hallmark movie has the same script. Yeah, so they're all reruns, you know, essentially. It's the same plot, or lack thereof. Anyhow, I'm probably digging myself this enormous hole, uh, insinuating that I happen to think it's intellectually stagnant, but I'd, I wouldn't say that out loud. Ever. But uh, where was I? Oh, he said, you know... I've been watching too much of that, so I think you're just supposed to follow your heart. We were joking around, of course. And, and we hear that in our culture, just follow your heart. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Follow your head or something. Follow God's word, but don't follow your heart. The Bible says it's deceitfully wicked. I'll give you that verse. It's in Jeremiah, if I remember correctly. But, you know, it's the heart of man that deceives him. Actually, when I was in high school, I had to take a class. I was a senior in high school, and they were, I had to make up some sort of health credit or something like that. I barely went to school as a senior. And, um, but they, uh, so they stuck me in this class called Marriage and Family. Yeah, and so I just did what I often do. You know, I read the text and then just kind of, I shouldn't say what I did out loud. I just read the text and didn't pay attention. But, um, you know, I guess if you read the text, it's okay. And so uh, I passed, obviously. And, but I read the text, and, 
And in it, it said, the problem with many Americans is they marry for love. And they were, they were speaking in terms of romantic love, right? They marry because of romance, not compatibility. And so, you know, here I am, 18 years old, and, and kind of, this, this may surprise you, but I was kind of non-emotional and, and, and intellectual about everything. And so, yeah. And so I went, huh, okay, well, that makes sense to me. That's logical. So actually, you know, when Debbie and I were, were if we used an old word, courting, um, I actually would, we'd, we talked openly back and forth. What do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And what do you think about this? How do you feel about God? What do you think about worship? How do you think children should be raised? What do you think about husband? And, I mean, we talked about all the, the important stuff. And we discovered we were compatible 39 years later, apparently. Right? And, and in that time, we haven't always felt jovial towards one another. And it's so good that we never followed our heart because our heart would say, oh, it's never going to work out, just give up. But our head said, no, this is what you're supposed to. You, you see the difference? It's the same thing with walking with Jesus because the church is, is betrothed to the Lord, not quite married yet, but we're the bride, not the wife, but the bride. That's a whole nother talk. Let me read this big chunk of scripture from 2 Peter chapter 1 and, and talk as quickly as I can through this. <clears throat> God's divine power has given us everything we need. I'm in, starting in verse 3. To, for life and for godliness, this power was given to us through knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and integrity. Through his glory and integrity, he has given us his promises that are the highest value through these promises, you will share in divine nature because you have escaped the corruption that sinful desires cause in the world. Because of this, make every effort to add integrity to your faith and to integrity add knowledge, to knowledge add self-control, to self-control add endurance, to endurance add godliness, to godliness add Christian affection, and to Christian affection add love. If you have all these qualities they, and they are increasing, it demonstrates that your knowledge about our Lord Christ is living and productive. If that's a measurement, is what that is. <clears throat> if these qualities aren't present in your life, you're short-sighted and have forgotten that you were cleansed from your past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, use more effort to make God's calling and choosing of you secure. If you keep doing this, you will never fall away. Then you will also be given the wealth of entering into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I will also remind you about these qualities. Although you already know about them and are well grounded in the truth that you now have, as long as I am still alive, I think it's right to refresh your memory. I know that I will die soon. Our Lord Jesus Christ has made that clear to me, so I will make every effort to see that you remember these things after I die. Now, when we look at this, we, we, the first thing we learn from this passage is that God's divine power has given us all that we need. Now, I like that because here's the reality and here's something I've discovered in walking with Jesus. So I came to the Lord somewhere between 1970 and 78. I don't remember the actual day or any of that stuff, but it was in that realm of my life. And from then to now, what I've discovered is I have kept coming to the Lord in a faithful way, but he has done all the work. He has done all the transforming. He's done all the changing. Now, if you don't believe that, have you read Romans 7 and ever identified with that passage where it says, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I do want to do, I don't do, and, and that whole quandary of, of divided will that he struggles with and thought, that's kind of like me. How much power do you really have without the Lord transforming you? I mean, it's so easy. If I said the word, if I, if I told you, you know, this is how human beings are. Don't think about hamburgers. It's all you're going to think about. I've just ruined your whole service, you know, because now you're going to think about hamburgers. Because I said, don't think about hamburgers. How much control do you actually have? 
Some of you are thinking about leaving right now. Uh, I wonder why. But how much control do you have? And, and the reality is there are these wonderful things that God promises to do and we keep taking it away from him and taking credit from him whenever we succeed. But the reality is it's he who begins and does the good work. God enables you to be a Christian. Now we read in, Ma- in uh, sorry, I said Matthew. We, I'm, I'm reading the page right now. In Acts chapter 16, we read the, the, the scenario where, where uh, Paul comes to the Philippi area and he goes down by the river where prayers were being made and he meets this gal named Lydia who was a seller of purple, which is a, a purple cloth because she would get the dye and et cetera. And that was a big deal. And it says in there that God made her heart want to hear Paul's preaching. In other words, God made it possible inside of her to hear Paul's preaching. And I look at that and I think, well, wait a minute. She didn't have anything to do with that. God did something in her to hear the word. That's a beautiful thing. And you say, well, that just seems too controlling. As I read that story, I think she was pretty glad he did that. And, and so we, we begin to realize that it is God that enables us to follow him. And, and we're not doing this without him. See, the problem of those guys in Matthew 7 when they show up and they say, look at the cool stuff we did in your name. They thought they had to do stuff to enter into heaven, but really they had to put themselves into the presence of God so he would work. You know, it isn't you that changes your heart. It's him. And, and well, maybe one reason our heart doesn't change fast enough is we keep trying to do it instead of giving it to him to do it. And, and you ever have that deal where... Uh, someone wants you to fix something, but they won't get out of your way to do it. You know, someone's car breaks and say you're a mechanic, and they keep standing in between you and the car so they can't actually see what's broken or make a diagnosis. We do that to Jesus. I'm not a mechanic. Um, you know, I mean, I've worked on stuff, but, but I know, I know I have certain skill sets and occasionally people will want me to fix a broken instrument or something. And it's, it's always hard when they keep trying to do it instead of getting out of the way and letting me touch it. And I think about what we're doing to the Lord. If you want to do it on your own, you're not releasing yourself for him to do it. Now, I'm not saying you don't have personal responsibility. This isn't permission to be lethargic or lazy about your walk with the Lord. But get up each day, do the right thing, pursue him, and watch what God will do. If you will do your part, he will do his, and it will be amazing. And and incidentally, because, you know, we need a scripture to support everything we think. Um, Well, we do, but... Philippians 1 6. Now think about this. I'm convinced that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it through to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Now we can just answer, ask some simple questions and come up with some really good answers. Who began the good work in you? The Bible says God. Right? Are you struggling with that? says, God begin the good work in you. Okay. Who will carry this good work in to a completed state? Yeah, that's what it says. Who will bring this work to completion? God. Who begin it? God. Who completes it? God. When will the completion occur? The day of the Lord Jesus. You say, you know, so there's your answer, by the way. You say, I've been walking with God a long time, and I just don't feel like like I've arrived yet. Dear Lord, Jesus hasn't happened. 
I mean, there's a, that's what's funny. There's actually a very simple Bible text that explains that for us. The Lord hasn't returned. That's why you haven't arrived. And incidentally, these people that the Lord rejects at the great white throne in Matthew 7, what are they really saying? Lord, we arrived. And he's like, well, I never knew you, which is, I don't want to get into that, but it's an interesting statement. It's not, I knew you and forgot you, or we were once friends and you walked away. It's, I never knew you. Right? And I looked it up in the original language, and guess what? It means never. And, and so we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, the promise of the second coming of the Lord is this. It will happen in an instant, in a split second, at the sound of the last trumpet. Indeed, that trumpet will sound, and then the dead will come back to life. They will be changed so that they can live forever. And we, in our old King's English, we might read, changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I wonder who does that. Yeah, it's God. So immediately we begin to realize that if we just put ourselves in God's presence, if we become his followers, he makes these things happen. And see, when you see in Matthew 7, these people telling about all they did, they were responsible for, they, they believed in their minds somehow they were responsible for their own spiritual success. That's not a biblical concept. That's not a biblical concept that you are responsible for your own spiritual success. Because what do we, what do we realize? That, that the Bible says, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain and who build it. That's in Psalm 27, 127. Right? So who builds the house if it's going to be a success? By the way, one plants and one waters, but God gives what? Who gives the fruit? So, at, I mean, now I'm not absolving you of personal responsibility. You read the word, you find out what you're supposed to do, and you follow those steps. That's absolutely our, our side of the relationship. We have personal responsibility. But the fruitfulness, your spiritual success, that growth... When you've done all, taken all the steps to pursue him, the rest is up to him. He is promised to work in us. He who has begun the good work will be faithful to complete it. I love that. Do you ever see your shortcomings? I hope the answer is yes. I hope the answer is yes. That's a good sign. If the answer is no, I never see my shortcomings, that's your shortcoming. All right. And the good news is this. He will be faithful. God will be faithful to complete it. See, there this this thing happened uh to the Western church. I know you guys love church and I talk church history. It's just so amazing and fascinating. This thing happened to the, it is actually, but the thing, there's something uh, interesting happened to the Western church that didn't happen to the Eastern church. And incidentally, when I say Western, Eastern, I'm talking about, uh, you know, there was a dividing line, you know, East and West over the, where the, the Holy Land would have been. So, so like um, the Eastern church had its seat, you know, in, in Armenia, let's say. And the, um, the Western church had its seat in Rome because that was the old world. And, and Alexandria also had an orthodoxy that would be considered like with the Eastern church. When they divided, something happened in the Western world that didn't happen in the Eastern world. And, and it affected people's view of Christianity. What happened, in, well, there are a couple things that happened. But one of the things that happened in the, the Western world was Renaissance. Now, if you're a student of history, you understand the Renaissance, which started happening like the 12th century and worked its way through. <clears throat> and the goal of the Renaissance was to become, they coined this word in Italy, they, that, that, that the goal of the Renaissance was to become the perfect humanista. 
humanista. That's, they got that word. And it was the birth of what is called Renaissance humanism. Which is kind of a reinvention of Confucianism, but, but in any, you don't want me to get into that. But in any case, humanism was birthed in the Renaissance and the go, a perfect humanista was this, was this individual who was self-actualized. They, they, were an, they were athletic, they were well-read, they understood music, they were broad and they were intelligent and they were informed and they were educated and if they did all the things right, if they ate right, if they, if they lived right, if they thought right, they were the perfect human, right? If they were 10% body fat or whatever it's supposed to be, you know, I prefer, you've heard of the tribulation, I like having a tribulation-ready body, <laughs> right? I mean, if we're in starvation mode, I'm going to outlast some of you. It's that simple. Right? That's called, I'm a prepper. Yeah. <laughs> so, not really. <laughs> but uh, I'm like the opposite of that. But in any, in any case, what was I talking about? The Renaissance. If you became this perfect person, that was the, that was the goal of humanity. That was your purpose. And, and what happened is, Renaissance humanism worked its way into the Western church. In fact, there was a priest named Amaris who was a Renaissance humanist. And, and in fact, Martin Luther wrote a treatise called On Bondage of the Will in English. It, the translation of the Latin text is The Unfree Will. But, but as he wrote this, it was, it was like an intellectual argument against Amaris' point of view on Renaissance humanism. And in that, the church became a self-help institution instead of a gospel institution. And whereby legalism creeps in to the point of saying, if you just become the perfect person, you'll go to heaven. But you need to think about this. Right? How many times, if, well, if you're sad, you're not a good Christian. And I've heard this stuff in my lifetime of serving the Lord. Well, if you're sad, you're not a good Christian. If you get depressed, you don't have enough faith. If you're ever angry, that's a sin. Actually, the Bible says be, how many know the Bible says be angry? Now, I know you're dying to quote the, the rest of it. But, oh, oh, sin not. Be angry and sin not. You got to add the sin not. Well, it first says be angry. It's okay. Just don't let that anger produce sin. In fact, of all the emotions that the human being has, there's just a few of them that the Lord doesn't have. Obviously, fear. God doesn't have fear. He certainly doesn't have covetousness or greed. But, you know, when you think of joy and sadness and anger, God has all those. I wonder if it's because we are made in his likeness. And so what happens in the church where all of a sudden, if I don't hear God's word in my heart just right, something's wrong with me. Or, or if I ever feel frustrated, something's wrong with me. Or if I ever feel angry or sad, something's wrong with me. I'm not a good enough Christian. Listen, here's the rule that you have to understand. We are all broken. Right. So, so we love that passage. Paul is is pleading with the Lord to take something out of his life that that is a matter, whether it's physical or spiritual, it doesn't matter. It's the thorn in his flesh, and what does it represent? His imperfection. Now, many think it was his eyesight because he had some issues there, but but it doesn't really matter. It represents his human imperfection. And the Lord's response was, my grace is sufficient for you. Wow. My grace is sufficient for you. Your human condition is not sufficient. But his grace is. His favor is. His ability to develop you to transform you, to work in your life. 
You say, well, what changed when, when I gave my heart to Jesus? What really changed? I can tell you what changed in me when I gave my heart to Jesus. I went from wanting to do the wrong thing to wanting to do the right thing. When you think of your struggle, you have that struggle because your heart changed. The reason you long to be something different is because Jesus changed something in you. And he's going to complete that work. But we have to stay on the path. Now, I believe, and I'll talk more about it next week, I believe in the importance of diligence. Get up every day and do the right thing. Watch what God will do. Let's pray. Lord, it's my prayer that you'll move in our lives in unique and powerful ways. And Lord, your word shows us that you've promised to work changes in us. I pray that we will have the faith to believe that you have done this and we have yet to see it. But we commit our lives to you. We know that you are able to keep that which we've committed to you. And we commit our lives to you. And we claim that promise that he who has begun a good work is pow- will be faithful to complete it. And we believe what Peter says, that the power of God has all that we need for living. That it's not by might or strength or by our own power or discipline, but it's by your spirit that works in us and transforms us. And Lord, if you're patient with us, may we be patient with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you guys. Thank you.